strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. upon each one of us. 
as we share together this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Welcome into the Lord's house. It is good to be together. We just thank the Lord for each one and for the beautiful day that he's given us to gather and to, to get out and enjoy all that he's created. I hope that as you came this morning, you, you looked about and you saw the sunshine and you saw the green grass and the flowers blooming and all the beauty that he's created. What a blessing. We do want to recognize any visitors. If you're visiting with us today, uh, we'd like to welcome our guests. Would you raise your hand if you're visiting with us? It is good to have each one here. We thank the Lord for our time together and ask his blessing upon our, our worship this morning. Uh, quickly, I want to notice a few announcements in your bulletin. Uh, we, as we announced last week, we'll be taking our Easter offering this morning. This is a missions offering. And if you notice the note down here, it says the UV Global Easter offering this year for Easter. We're raising money for uh, to fund long-term outreach opportunities to bring the hope and love of Jesus to a specific frontier group. Uh, for security reasons, we're calling this group the Shoptar People. We will be taking a special offering this morning during our service. We will have the ushers come and pass the plates for our regular offering, and then they'll immediately come back. And as we're having our special music, they'll take the second offering, which will be the Easter offering. So we'll take both together. And so as they come and, and pass the plates a second time, it's not because you didn't fill them the first time. It's for a different offering. I've heard of churches somewhere. I don't know if that's real or not. But if they don't get it up the first time, they'll pass the plates again. Praise the Lord, we haven't had to do that. <laughs> Way off the subject. Uh, other activities today. Looking forward to this evening. Uh, Promised Land will be with us. Look forward to that. Unfortunately, I'm not able to be here, so I hope that you'll come and, and be here and support them and uh, show them that, that you appreciate their music, you appreciate their coming to Fox Run, and you want to support them. So do come this evening and uh, enjoy the concert. It is a free will concert, so there's no uh, admission, admission fee. Invite your friends, invite your family. And, uh, and come and support this and enjoy uh, the good music that they bring. Uh, free will offering is taken for uh, to, to help them with their expenses, but just come out and enjoy that time. Looking ahead through the week, uh, tomorrow evening, the Gowles will be hosting the Bible study uh, at their home. So those that are part of that, don't forget that. Wednesday morning, there's the Town and Country Bible Study out in Broadway, so we encourage you, if you're able, to, to do that. Uh, Thursday evening is the online Facebook Live Bible Study, uh, so lots of opportunities for Bible study. Please take it, uh, advantage of those opportunities as you're able. Next Sunday, the book club will be meeting following the worship time, and I understand that the pastor has other obligations on Sunday afternoon, so he'll not be able to do the Timberview service that's mentioned here in the bulletin. Uh, looking ahead, Tuesday of next week, VBS planning meeting. So those who are responsible of working with VBS, uh, make note of that if you're able to come and, and be part of that. And then as we look forward to Mother's Day and Mother's Day activities on Saturday night, there's the ladies' night out. And so ladies, mark your calendars and plan to be here. And uh, come and enjoy a good time of, of fellowship uh, together that evening. Excuse and, me, John. Yes, ma'am. We will pass today a sign-up sheet just so that you get us an idea of those attending. It does have a place for ladies, and it also has a place for men to volunteer to serve the ladies. This does not obligate you, but it sort of gives us an opportunity to plan. And we'll pass it again next week as well. All right. And Barbara has a sign-up sheet. If you didn't hear, that will be for the ladies to sign up to be here so they have a head count to know how many to plan for. And for us guys to commit to coming and helping to make the, the evening special for the ladies and, and to volunteer to help. Uh, the guys aren't going to come and sit back and and relax with the ladies. We're going to make the ladies able to have a good evening. Right? Thank you. So she'll be passing that uh, following the, the offering, I guess, this morning. Yeah, yeah shortly. Yeah. Shortly. As it comes around, sign up. Sign up. All right. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, 
Uh, and then on Sunday morning, the 8th, uh, Mother's Day, um, as always, uh, Colonel puts together a Mother's Day breakfast, and so uh, ladies come expecting uh, to have a good time of fellowship and good food, and uh, hey, men can participate in that as well. And uh, we get to eat too. But thanks to Carla. She's, uh, she's recovering. She's uh, one arm right now, but we're just uh, are thankful for all that she does and for uh, committing that she's going to make sure this happens for the ladies this year, as always. Thank you. Are there other announcements anyone would like to share at this time? Let's take just a moment or two and greet one another, and then we'll have our chorus. I keep falling in love with him.
Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house again this morning. We've asked you to bless everyone here. Bless those that have to give. Bless those that do not. Bless those who are missing, whatever the reasons may be, and lead them back to us. Lord, let us all be more faithful to thee and go out and tell others about thee. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> For each need, 
God, you are so gracious and so kind to us. You give us things, Lord, that none of us deserve. All of the time, you lavish out on both the wicked and the righteous the blessings of daily life. And I ask, Lord, that in your kindness, you would hear the prayers of your church. Send revival, Lord, we pray. I pray, Lord, that the time that, appoint, that was appointed for this revival would come soon. And I pray, Father, that the time that you have in mind would not be late in coming nor early in coming, but just at the right time. And that way, Lord, all those that you intend to save and know will be saved will come into the kingdom. Perhaps, Lord, even a great number in these days. We pray, Lord, for those that are on the emergency services and in the military. I pray, Father, your hand on them. I pray, Father, you would be with those that are in the mission field. I pray, Lord, that they would all accomplish what you have in mind for them to accomplish. Continue, Lord, to be with those that are struggling with health issues today. We think of Dennis, Lord, as he is heading into this shoulder surgery. I pray your hand on him and upon Tammy, Lord, for they need your comfort and they need your guidance during this time. Thank you for your hand on our sister Carla and continue to be with her. And we, Lord, we think about those that have undergone operations recently and have undergone tests recently. And we ask God your hand on them. For all of us, Lord, in some fashion are touched by these health issues, Lord, which are a tremendous part of our prayer list. And we ask, Lord, you would meet the needs of the people in accordance, Lord, with your goodwill and pleasure. May it be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, now I don't know if it's this microphone or this microphone, but something is really hot. And I'm afraid that if I talk too loud, I'm gonna get feedback, so. If, I don't know which needs to be turned down, but something does. There it goes, there's the ring. So uh, if I seem a little bit shy, it's only because of that. Um, I want us to take a look at the scripture today, thank you. I want us to take a look at the scripture today uh, with regards to salvation. That's the theme throughout this year, uh, the salvation of Christ. And today, we are looking at how the love of Christ has saved us. Um, I, I think there's often a, a, a misunderstanding on this respect. I think that often we think that uh, we are lovable and therefore God has loved us. And because he loved us, even though he says he's going to destroy us, he's decided, nah, nah, I love these guys too much. Oh, you crazy kids. No, that's, that's not exactly what's going on. If it were not for the fact that Christ has a perfect love for God the Father, you and I would have no access to mercy whatsoever. And that, my friends, you can take it however you want, either as frightening or you can take it as assurance. Because in Christ, you are saved. Out of Christ, you are not. And that is the simple truth of the scripture in its testimony. Take a look at the testimony of John the Baptist in John chapter 3. A different John wrote the gospel than John the Baptist, but he writes of John the Baptist because he was a uh, he was a disciple of John the Baptist prior to coming to discipleship in Christ, and so he knows things other people don't know. 
And so he tells us here in John chapter 3, verses 26 to 36. Um, if I can find my little 26. Oh, there it is. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, the man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he's baptizing, and everyone is going to him. To this John replied, a person can receive only what he is given from heaven. You, yourselves, uh, you yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but am a, a, a sent ahead of him. And the bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy. When he hears the bridegroom's voice, that joy is mine, and it is now complete. We must become, or he must become greater, I must become less. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. Whoever has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the Spirit without limit. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in His hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, and whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. We often read John 3.16 that God so loved the world. I have made the statement, I'll stand by it. You should never share John 3.16 without sharing John 3.36. Otherwise, you give people the wrong idea. The wrong idea is that God loves the whole world and he's going to save the whole world and he's going to find a way to do it because God never ever doesn't get what he wants. And thus we have these books that are out these days saying that everybody is going to be saved. That is universalism. It is not biblical theology. It is a theology that is based on a passage and then based upon a philosophy. It's dangerous to believe it. It may feel good to embrace it. But in the end, it will bring judgment upon you and upon all that believe you. Do not purport it. Do not harbor it in your hearts. Because John 3.36 follows up, everyone who believes in the Son will have eternal life, but whoever does not believe in Him will not see life, because God's wrath remains on them. You see, the starting point is that God's wrath is upon all human beings. In spite of the fact that he loves the whole world, his wrath is upon every human being. That's the starting point. If you do not understand the starting point, you do not understand the journey. The journey makes no sense unless you understand where it is we've all begun. And we all begin under the wrath of God. The struggle of salvation is not to find some way to get God to relent from his great wrath. The struggle of salvation is how do we satisfy the wrath of God? And no man can satisfy the wrath of God except that they be killed. 
because of the great offense. Not just that we have committed, but that we are against the holy nature and righteous nature of God. The question is then, how do we satisfy the wrath of God and still see life in some kind of a resurrection? The answer is Jesus. It's Jesus. The greatness of Jesus' ministry looks like this. First of all, it exceeds the ministry of repentance unto reconciliation within himself. John's baptism, the Bible says, was a baptism of repentance. Jesus goes beyond repentance to reconciliation. This does not mean men reconciling with one another, as the humanists say. This is men being reconciled to God, not reconciled through their own efforts, but God reconciling them to himself. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And uh, also at uh, verses 17 to 21. Starting at 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, that gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has uh, committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin <clears throat> for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Again, as you look at this passage, it seems that it is contradictory. For it says that God is reconciling us to himself. That means that the work of reconciliation is the work of God alone. Reconciling us to himself in Christ. That means that by being joined to Christ, one flesh with him, as the Bible says, with regards to marriage, the two shall become one flesh. Becoming one flesh with Christ, we are reconciled in the person of Christ. Not reconciled apart from Christ, not reconciled at the same time or beside or alongside of Christ. But reconciled in the person of Christ. And yet it says that God has, has uh, let's see, what was the passage here? I want to read it specifically to you. That God was reconciling the world to himself. Now do you see that there's a contradiction there? Because in one passage we see uh, that God so loved the world. In the other passage we see that God's wrath remains on those who don't believe in him. In this passage, we see that God is doing a work of reconciling us to himself in Christ. And then we see that God all along has been reconciling the world to himself. And there seems to be some kind of a contradiction here. Because on the one hand, it seems that God is preaching universalism. And on the other hand, it seems that God is preaching a very specific gospel to a very specific people. And that very specific people are only saved in Jesus Christ. We know that Jesus preached that there is a broad gate and a broad way that leads to destruction. And that there is a narrow gate and a narrow way that leads to eternal life. Jesus is that gate. Jesus is that way. And yet, we see all of these passages about the world, the world, the world. 
In order for us to understand this, we have to go back to John chapter 1. John prefaces his entire gospel by explaining this, that God came to the world, but the world didn't recognize him. And so the world, even though God loved it, and even though God expressed himself to the world, the world did not recognize him. And therefore the world has been cut out of salvation as a whole. And then it says he came to his own, but his own did not receive him. His own would be the nation of Israel. And the scripture says that since his own didn't receive him, that his own as a whole are cut out of the plan of salvation. And then it follows up and it says, but to as many as received him, to those who believed on his name, gave he the power to become children of God. And then he explains children not born of natural descent, not born of a human decision, not born of a husband's will, children born of God. So the whole preface to the gospel of John is that God loved the world, but the world didn't recognize him. Therefore, they have been cut out of the plan of salvation as a whole. He came to his own, but his own didn't receive him. Therefore, his own were cut out of the plan of salvation as a whole. But then there is a third group of people that as many as received him, to those who believed on his name, gave you the power to become children of God. This is what Jesus also calls in another place the elect. This, my friends, it should not be confused with the term elite. The elect are not the elite. In fact, the scripture says about us, the elect, that most of you were not powerful, most of you not influential, most of you were base with regards to the, to the things of this world, but God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And so we have here not elect also meaning elite, but elect in spite of the fact that we are not, in terms of this world, elite. So do not confuse the two terms, for the scripture does not. And therefore, if you do, you get the idea in your head that being part of the elect means you're part of the elite. No, you are not. Most of us that are of the elect are the common folk, the ones that nobody would consider smart, brave, uh, chivalrous, or whatever, but most of us, we would be considered base. Ephesians 2, 11 to 18, I probably should get through these three scriptures here because these are all very important scriptures to this point. Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 11 to 18. Therefore, remember that formerly you who were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body with human hands. Remember that at the same time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners in the covenants of the promise without hope without God in the world. But now Christ Jesus, you in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by set, setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both them to God through the cross, by which they're put to death their hostility. He came 
and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. And Colossians 1 verses 15 to 20. And here we read, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the first fruits from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all the fullness dwell, all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven or uh, by making peace through his blood died on the cross. And so here we see in this passage, these passages the reconciliation of God. Reconciling to himself both Jew and Greek in the blood of Christ. Reconciling all things to himself for all things belong to Christ whether they are powers or rulers or such. All things belong to him. His ministry exceeds the best of teachers and prophets. As Jesus said in Matthew 11, 11 about John the Baptist, he said, no one of all men born to women, none was better than John the Baptist. So above all the prophets, above Moses, above the law, John the Baptist stood head and shoulders according to Jesus. Not just sentiment, for if it were sentiment, we could dismiss this as, as unnecessary scripture, and there is no unnecessary scripture, therefore, this is not just sentiment. God is serious when he speaks through Christ. And says of, of all that were born to women, none was greater than John the Baptist. And John says of Christ, he must become greater, I must become less. And therefore John acknowledges, so Jesus acknowledges John to be the best and the greatest teacher of all time. And John acknowledges Jesus to be superior and supreme in his ministry. And therefore, John's ministry must decrease while Christ's ministry increased. Do you see the greatness of Christ's ministry? That he is reconciling to himself a people? That while he loves the world and while he loves Israel, he is only reconciling to himself a people chosen of him to be his bride. And that is his decision. That is his right. He is sovereign after all. And all things are being reconciled to him, Jew and Greek, and all things in earth, above the earth, and under the earth, all being reconciled to him, for all belongs to Jesus. Here's the basis of his ministry. First of all, he is a bridegroom, redeeming a pride, out of the world. Ephesians is not too far off. If your thumb is still in Colossians, turn back to Ephesians 1. As we look through 1 to 14, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful of Jesus, grace and peace be unto our Father, be to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him 
before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. To In love, he predestined us for adoption of sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will for the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will concerning his good pleasure, which he proposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth and under, uh, under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who worked out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory, and you also included in Christ when you heard the message of the truth that the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So, this bridegroom is redeeming a bride for himself. In chapter 5 of Ephesians also, he talks about redeeming us and making us a bride, unblemished, radiant, spotless, unwrinkled. That is the bride, and it is the work of God through Christ. The, the basis of Christ's ministry is not the moral capabilities of humankind, but it is the redemptive capabilities of Jesus. That is the basis of the ministry of God through Jesus Christ. Not that you and I are moral creatures worthy of redemption, but the fact that we are unworthy, that we are miserable, that we are without hope, and God provides in one man that hope that we had not without him. The idea that God saves you as an independent agent is not true. You are saved by being reconciled to God in Christ. You are not saved because of a prayer. You are not saved because of church attendance. You are not saved because of membership. You are not saved by any of these exterior means. You are saved because Jesus perfectly loves his bride and is committed from the foundation of the world to appointed times and appointed places to redeem to himself a people to be his bride. Because Christ is committed to this and he is not impotent, it is in his power to form a bride and to form that bride, that church, out of individuals. While he loved the world, he only saved individuals out of it. While he loved Israel, he only saved individuals out of it. But he did not save them to be their own people. He saved them to be his people. And to be reconciled in his body with God the Father. And thereby we receive all that we need for salvation. 
He is also a son perfectly pleasing his father. 2 Peter chapter 1 and uh, verses 16 to 18. Here we read this. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard the voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. This voice was not to say, I'm pleased with this guy, do what he does, I'll be pleased with you. That's not what the voice said. The voice singled out one man of all humanity, Jesus Christ, and said only of him, he is my son, and I am pleased with him. Nobody else ever has heard that message from the majestic glory. No human being on the face of this earth has ever heard God say, you are my son, and with you I am well pleased. There's one man out of all humanity that God is well pleased with. And no other man will ever reach that status. Because Jesus did not have to reach that status. He was born in that status. He could have fallen from that status... But he was tempted in every way as we are, yet was without sin. And therefore, he is a son who is perfectly pleasing to the Father. Therefore, he becomes now a mediator, reconciling both within himself. As it says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, there's one man and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. And if you turn to Hebrews chapter 9 with me. Looking at verses 13 to 15. And here we read the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now he that is died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. And so here... We see in two passages, Christ is the mediator. He is the person in whom the love of God and the guilt of men meet. And the guilt of men is erased in Christ because Christ being the head is not guilty. But the sins of those he saves had to be paid for so that he might become our Savior. So we have certainty now to Christ's ministry. 
And this certainty starts out this way. God has placed everything in his hands. He is the only beneficiary of all humanity, of every space and every time. We see in Isaiah 63, 17, that God has placed the inheritance. He calls, that he calls those he is saving his inheritance. Take a look with me, if you will. Isaiah 63, and 17. Why, Lord, do you make us wander from your ways and harden our hearts so that we do not revere you? Return for the sake of your servants, the tribes that are your inheritance. So here in the scripture, we see the acknowledgement of the prophet and the acknowledgement of God that he is the one that causes them to wander. He is the one that has hardened their hearts. And they say, why are you continuing to do this? Please, bring us back to yourself for the sake of your inheritance. And uh, in Jeremiah 2, 7, we also see this. I brought you into a fertile land to eat its fruit and rich produce, but you came and defiled my land and made my inheritance detestable. In both cases, God is calling the land of Israel and the promises that he has made to them an inheritance. And this inheritance is for Jesus Christ. He's the only beneficiary. If you are in Christ, those benefits come to you. If you are not in Christ, they do not come to you. It's a very simple matter. If I should receive an inheritance from some unknown rich uncle, and he should give me $10 million, my entire family is going to be blessed by that. Not just me. My whole family would be blessed by it. And those even that I loved nearby would be blessed by it. In the same fashion, those who are in Christ Jesus enjoy all of the benefits of the inheritance of Christ, which is everything. Everything is the inheritance of Christ. Not a single thing, not a single drop is reserved for any human being. You will receive nothing on your own. I don't care how many times the health and wealthers come up there and tell you, oh, believe in Christ and all your health problems will be gone. Believe in Christ and you'll be wealthy. Believe in Christ, give me a thousand dollars, he'll give you ten. Come on. Let's be serious and let's be real about this. The gospel tells us that mankind has no inheritance. For eternity. None. It doesn't change just because you send up a few prayers and send a thousand dollars to some fellow on the TV or girl, depending on who it is making that price, that promise to you. It's not going to change. All of it goes to Jesus. All of it belongs to Jesus. Everything. From the dust under your feet to the molecules of air above you. All of it belongs to Jesus Christ. And he is giving none of it away. It is his. The Father and the Son share a perfect love. We see this in John 14, verses 18 to 31. As Jesus talks about his love for the Father, and the Father, how he loves the Son. Take a look with me, if you would, so that we can see it in writing. John 14, 
starting at verse 18 of chapter 14 of John. It says this, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the same one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Uh, checking for the limitations of my passage all the way to 31, it says. Then Judas, not Iscariot, said, Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are, my, are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, when the Father will send, who the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, not as the world gives, give I you, no. Do not be, uh, do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. You've heard me say I'm going away, and I'm coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. Let's see, I have told you this before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not say much more to you, for the prince of this world is coming, and he has hold, no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I am in the Father, and I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. So this, this passage talks about the unity of the Father and the Son, how they are one with each other, and it draws us in and says that if we are in Christ, Christ will be in us. This is speaking of the one flesh nature of marriage, that the two become mystically, in a sense, one flesh. We are one flesh spiritually with Christ. We literally are joined to him in spirit. We literally are a part of his spiritual person. And thereby we are saved. We are not saved because we do this or that or make this effort or that effort. We are saved because Christ has done everything. And if we are in him, all the things that Christ has done come to us. The salvation of God, then, is not dependent upon the quality of our love for Jesus, but of Jesus' love for us. In the scripture we read in 1 John 4.10, now this is love, not that we love God, but that God loved us. We are saved by the love of Christ. The love that he has for the Father saves us. The love that he has for his bride saves us. We are saved by his love, not by our love for God, for our love for God is as our righteousness. It's filthy rags. We are unable to love God the way that God deserves. We are unable to love him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Even so, we are unable to love our neighbor as ourselves. Yet Jesus loves the Lord with all of his heart, mind, soul, and strength. Jesus does love his neighbor as himself. If you want to fulfill those two commands, put your faith in Jesus Christ. 
Call out for mercy. Seek him with all of your heart. Do not give rest to your eyes until you and Christ are one flesh and you know it because he has deposited the Holy Spirit within you, guaranteeing what is to come.
indeed, Jesus, how great thou art. You are our creator. You are our master. You are our savior. We acknowledge you in all things, and we thank you for your great love. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you that you came down from heaven for us, that through you, and through faith and trust in you, in giving our life to you and living in you, we have the promise of eternal life. How great thou art. Amen. Amen.